fucking monkey. Okay. Why am I? Can't close the door, mate. No. Sir? Said you can't close the door, mate. Because I thought someone was coming behind me. I'll make a big deal out of it, all right? It's all good. Okay. What do you accept, mate? You're the one still going on no. about it. You're the one who started it. Don't start it. That's what I'm saying. Go away. Keep talking. You're a black dog. Keep... There, there you go. Oh Excellent. God. I speculated that I had gained some credibility from having recorded some solid video of Whitebeard behaving badly, which I then showed to the police. I predicted, therefore, that any replacement agents who came along to take over from where Whitebeard left off would likely opt for a more cautious approach than Whitebeard. As I explained in my last video, the one on the left is a known acquaintance of Whitebeard. He's been relatively low-key lately, but then again, so has Whitebeard. So I still consider him to be a very strong candidate as a replacement agent because he was in the park that morning and because of the company he keeps. You know what they say, birds of a feather. It's a message to me from his demonic overlords that there are ways around my camera. It's a message meant to discourage me and take the wind out of my sails in thinking the camera makes me safe. I tell you what, this camera is a line in the sand. Any gang stalkers that come along knocking trying to cross that line, I will record them and expose them to the world. So those gang stalkers better watch themselves. At the time of putting this video together, the open hostility of a few months ago has largely gone into remission, and gang stalkers are exercising a lot more caution around me these days. The next clip shows you what I mean, where a perfectly positioned perp standing in front of my building on the opposite side of the street starts calling out to me as I'm returning home from my routine morning walk. Without having spent the last two decades as a TI, I would probably have answered him, but that's not the case, and my experiences have taught me to be circumspect in all my interactions with people. I've developed a sixth sense for knowing when there's a perp about, and my intuition said something about his vibe flagged him as a perp. Not to mention the fact that he called me a dickhead before I even answered him. In my experience, perps are only good for one thing, drama, and I was in no mood for it. So I ignored him in the faint hope that he might just give up and go away. I eventually had to turn and face him as he wasn't far behind me. Once he saw the camera perched on my chest, he quickly lost interest, confirming my suspicions that his intentions were likely not honourable ones. His reaction perfectly captures the prevailing mood amongst local harassment agents these days. But despite my success in beating back the more openly combative forms of gang stalking over the last year, the infernal gods of gang stalking are a fiercely jealous and persistent lot, and they are not so easily discouraged. And so the gang stalking continues in a less obvious but more aggravating form, with perps relying less on the old favourites like racial provocation, and more on the use of tactics that are better at blending in with the lawful routine of everyday life, because they're based on socially acceptable behaviours and activities.
This shift in strategy allows gang stalkers to continue messing with my ability to enjoy a nice quiet life of peaceful anonymity without leaving any clear evidence for the camera. Any attempt to record the harassment and report it as such is likely to cop a fair amount of skepticism and maybe suggestions I might be a little paranoid. Nevertheless, I'm going to discuss this ongoing shift in strategy among local gang stalkers and what form they appear to be taking. Now, despite the fact that the next two clips are open to more than one interpretation, the reason I've included them is the perfect timing with which things happen in them. In fact, the theme of perfect timing runs through the entire video. It happens again and again because they're not accidents. They are deliberate, carefully planned, premeditated acts of aggression or intimidation designed to control my emotional life. In other words, the idea is to keep me constantly frustrated from not being left alone in peace. Take the clip you're looking at now, for example. Most mornings I pass this area on my morning walk. On this particular morning, there's a parked van waiting to pull out into the road. Despite giving two other pedestrians ahead of me right of way to cross the road in front of them, the driver of the van neglects to do the same for me when I attempt to cross the same road several seconds later. Instead, and as if out of spite, the driver stays put after the pedestrians have crossed before pulling out into the road at the exact moment that I attempt to cross it, turning in front of me and blocking my path. Now, some people might say that on its own, the clip doesn't prove anything that maybe the driver didn't see me coming. But again, it's the perfect timing of it. And look how close I was to the driver's compartment when the van started moving. He should have been able to see me in the side mirrors, but any spiteful intentions on the part of the driver is gonna be difficult to prove. So the whole situation can be explained away as an honest mistake. However, I know better. The next clip also demonstrates the same precision timing of an attack that has been masked with a false appearance of coincidence. In a moment you'll see me cross the main road in front of me and then continue down a side street once I'm on the other side. Once I'm on the side street, you'll see a motorcyclist sitting on his bike, parked on the right side of the street. It takes me maybe 15 to 20 seconds to reach him, but like the driver of the van, he doesn't do anything onto the exact moment I walk past him. At that point, he conveniently starts up the very loud engine of his bike making me jump. It might seem trivial now, but I anticipate that noise harassment will play a bigger role in the future in an effort to keep me unsettled, being invoked anytime I'm out in public and I appear to be in a relaxed state of mind or lost in thought.
Meanwhile, gang stalkers continue to give me dirty looks or stare at me for longer than most people consider to be reasonable or polite. The intention is to signal that I'm the subject of constant surveillance. They're also trying to give me the impression that I'm up against an unwavering and united consensus of resentment towards someone they've all been told is a villain. It's meant to make venturing out in public a mentally draining and demoralizing experience for me, and the hope is that I'll avoid going outside as I did in the past. But if I were to do this, it would mean giving up on my goals. Once you do that, you open the door to despair, and that's exactly where demons want their targets, wallowing in misery. As I've said in previous videos, I believe gang stalking is based on the joining of forces between human gang stalkers and demons in order to generate more emotional suffering in the world which these evil spirits can then harvest and feed off. On the one hand, because they cannot do it alone, demons use gang stalkers, amongst others, to feed their insatiable appetite for human suffering. Having no physical form of their own, they are forced to seek out suitably disposed human beings to be their proxies here. Some of the more bizarre things I've seen as a TI suggest that some gang stalkers even act as hosts to demonic possession. For their part, the gang stalkers must feel empowered working in numbers, having a common cause to rally around which they've been told is for the greater good. For example, agents are often told that a particular target is a bad seed, and the police are often weaponized to keep the target in line. I know I'm viewed that way. I've been accused of all kinds of things. These accusations are then used as a basis for a smear campaign to influence other people's opinions of me. So with this mutually beneficial relationship between gang stalker and demon in place, the stage is set, and demon kind is given a clear pathway to reach into this world to gain a foothold in the lives of targeted individuals, and like a fungus, trouble keeps trying to rear its ugly head. Yeah, because I'm gonna run out of uh, soap, bars of soap tomorrow, I think, and then uh, we've got the weekend. So, yeah. I'm not going on the weekend, that's for sure. It's a waste because the library closes at half past five. It's not worth it.
As a mirror of the possessive and interfering nature of demons, gangstalkers often feel like they have a right to touch me or my belongings any time they feel like it, and without my permission. After many years as a TI, much of my life punctuated by one drama after another, I've developed into something of a hardcore loner. I prefer to keep to myself, and I don't appreciate it when other people do not respect my boundaries. Uninvited touching is one of those boundaries. It's something I've been quite vocal about in the past, so I know it's been incorporated into my TI profile, as gangstalkers have frequently used it to irritate me. The clip you're looking at now is a textbook example of this, where after failing to get me to drop what I'm doing and giving my undivided attention, the perp on your screen then attempts to grab my laptop and pull out the cable connecting it to my external hard drive while I'm in the process of moving some important files over. As you know, computer files can become damaged if you disconnect a hard drive in the middle of a file transfer. Losing these files would have been a major inconvenience for me, so I was not happy, and I told him as much. I mean, forget what your views are on the subject of gangstalking and whether it's real or not. In anyone's book, this should be considered presumptuous and inconsiderate behaviour, and it's why I'm not going to settle for city life. People refuse to leave you in peace. In the past, gangstalkers have used unfounded accusations in the hopes of getting under my skin, just to jumpstart a confrontation. This kind of strategy has seen a resurgence, as it doesn't involve the use of disparaging remarks or physical violence, and it can be hard to disprove. Combined with the staring and dirty looks, it's supposed to give me the impression that I'm a complete outcast. Fortunately, I no longer care. The next clip demonstrates how this type of attack unfolds. After I showed some video of the gangstalker I codenamed Whitebeard to the police, and the police consequently spoke to him about his antisocial behaviour, I predicted that he would be replaced by a new set of gangstalkers that I called replacement agents. The individual on your screen is one of them. Until now, he hasn't said or done a thing, and there's nothing particularly distinctive about his appearance. So I gave him the placeholder name, Pending, until he became an active agent. Well, he's the one featuring in the next clip, which means he's officially active as a replacement agent now. Since he took so long to become active, I've given him the same code name of Pending. Now, at the start of the clip, I'm at the local community centre I go to from time to time. This place does good work, and it's helped me a lot. But just like you find them anywhere else, gangstalkers are found there. Pending is also there. He leaves shortly before me. When I leave, I leave via the back gate, just in case Pending is still at the front gate. But after I've left, lo and behold, who do I see in the street heading towards me? Yep. Pending. There's that perfectly scripted timing thing again. So I step onto the side of the road to avoid him. Since I'm recording, I stand still and wait because sooner or later I know he's going to say or do something. Sure enough, just as I start walking away, Pending calls out to me, despite the fact that I never talked to him. In another example of the controlling nature of demons, he starts having a go at me over something about leaving the community centre bathrooms dirty. The bathrooms, each one with a toilet and a shower, are used by dozens of people all day, every day, and they tend to get dirtier as the day weighs on. They can get busy there, but the fact that he singled me out is telling. It's all part of the plan. He wants me to answer him because it will give him something to bounce off. This is how gang stalkers like Whitebeard create their pretext for starting trouble, so I know exactly how that's going to play out. Because I thought someone was coming behind me. You're a fucking monkey! The profile they keep on me tells them I have a strong sense of justice. So they use the combination of a lie and the conviction with which the lie is told to trigger me. But I don't play along. I stay quiet and I let Pending have the stage to himself.
Thank you for fucking missing the bathroom. Please. We need to shower. Please leave it clean. Please. I think that was just the beginning. Like Whitebeard, I suspect that Pending will look for ways to escalate this, including possibly more accusations, and I anticipate posting more videos of this perp in action. I mean, this is the guy that was looking at me like this. Now, do you think this is the look of someone motivated solely by the opportunity to offer some friendly or constructive advice, or is this the face of someone who wants to cause me harm?